it's a very important session and uh, there are some of, of the pioneer uh, institutions who did sic who did a start the sic sessions sic sic surgery in um, india and uh, delhi madurai and allahabad is one of them and uh, although it took some time to initiate surgeons to do sics because we were all doing ecc iul and uh, still there are many centers where they do ecc iul with the stitches and uh, they either do ecc iul or they do phaco emulsification as ics is not done excuse me you can talk outside so <coughs> uh, this has become now uh, an important part a uh, stepping stone to learn phaco emulsification if you know sics it becomes very easy to learn uh, fake emulsification like uh, our pavan is sitting here he did lots of sics from the department and now is doing wonderful fake emulsification is in his own place where he is uh, he's earning a lot because of fake emulsification <laughs> and sics both and for high volume centers this is a very very important surgery and it gives equally good results so we have eminent speakers first of all i would like to invite professor sp singh to come to the dais please professor Lag lahane and uh, professor ragni they are having they are from bombay and they are having their uh, sessions in a different hall also the same sics session is running simultaneously in hall h also so we would be interchanging between the two halls and then we have dr shama devedi she will dr shama shama acha idhar you please come on to the dais and uh, we have uh, dr pranav saluja who is also one of us from the same institution Re i'll request him to come to the dais he has gone out is it there you will sit there okay fine so the first talk would be by uh, none other than professor sp singh who is the director of the regional institute of ophthalmology and principal of the medical college and not one medical college is principal of several medical colleges because he is looking after so many colleges and almost all the appointments of uh, consultants is are made by him only so he has got wide experience on sics and does around 100 a case a day in the same hospital and may maybe at times 200 uh, sics plus phaco emulsification plus keratoplasty he is uh, doing lots of surgeries there and he has got very good uh, videos whether you see his videos on uh, uvit is small people or you if you come to mdi or if you have time you can talk to him also he has got wonderful videos on subluxated iul i don't think anybody else has such difficult cases of subluxated iuls in india or i would say in the world because those kind of uh, difficult cases i don't think many surgeons have done on subluxated which is uh, with wonderful videos so and um, then triple procedures also he does keratoplasty with cataract squint also he does and he is a master of dcr2 he was he went on for training of the trainers course in madurai for just two months and he showed his skills there also as a dcr surgeon in madurai i'll tell you that people were not doing dcr and Uh, our uh, rio is pioneer of dcr since the time of professor db chandra so with these many words i would like to invite professor sp singh to deliver his talk on small people and sics thank you good evening to everybody thank you very much dr kamal jay singh 
as you know this uh, already dr kamar ji singh has shown his greatness real greatness that uh, most of the time he appreciate his students colleagues as i would like to say one thing that the kamal ji is senior to me uh, you know in our medical education we taught uh, from just senior or two years three years of senior more than the uh, our teachers so they are like a teachers also so i work i started doing working there as a student life when he was there in the our institute so we are now working together and as is rightly rightly said that the, the darum surgery the number of patients is much more in up at our center we are carrying nearly 20000 surgery every year and the winter season is we are doing to 50 to 300 sometimes 350 operations per day similarly we are we are also doing though the session is uh, sics but we are also doing high number of phaco surgery in a day or more than 100 surgery phaco surgery we are doing our center uh, as a this because of some uh, our senior teachers dr arun mishra professor ji uh, this our dedan shrivastava and other teachers this is a blessing of our teachers uh, now this session you know very important session as yes, i see yes, dr kamal is a very right you said that uh, before starting or doing the feco it is uh, be equally important or very important to learn as i see as become a master of that then you will be much more comfortable or you may have much more confidence on doing the feco surgery because sometime what happens is after doing feco surgery if there is some of the complication that may require conversion of the feco into the as i see as so as i see as you should know not only simple case as i said in every complicated cases like the feco uh, once you become master you can do any kind of uh, situation any complicated situation you can feco similarly as i see as also this is such a good excellent surgery you can perform any any kind of cases either maybe heart cut tear staff cut tear this um, posterior polar cut tear subluxated lens small people uh, every, um, so and in evatic patient also but the, today i am just going to discuss uh, the this sics in, in, uh, in evatis this case a little bit different as you know uh, cataract is uh, the most common uh, complication of the evatis and during surgery uh, this evatic uh, cataract faces a lot of challenges to the surgeons maybe different uh, presentation sinicia uh, pupil membrane small pupil fibrous capsule and the involved on the posterior uh, segment also maybe vitreous opacities and uh, the po involved posterior segment so uh, cataract is you know a uh, uh, neurotic patient is really the cataract is caused by the uncontrolled and sustained inflammation but also by the prolonged use of the uh, high dose of corticosteroid maybe in the form of topical peri uh, periocular or systemic corticosteroid so usually the indication cataract is indicated primarily uh, for visually rehabilitation but it uh, also addresses the pathology in the posterior segment uh, and uh, you know evatic cataract has some challenges and such as you know the there is maybe in the evatic cataract associated with presence of posterior synechia atrophic iris small pupil pupillary membrane fibrous interior capsule mature cataract new basal angle zonal weakness and uh, some of the pathology of the this uh, posterior segment may be vitreatis choroidal thickening maybe sometime leads to the uh, rd as uh, cystoid megalocardial edema and uh, in the hypotony because of the ciliary membrane also these are the complex so this uh, evatic cataract is little bit different from the uh, this routine sics normal case of sics pre operative evaluation is very important uh, for the successful of the evatic cataract and most of the time this uh, it is evatic uh, associated uh, maybe because of the systemic involvement so if there is systemic involvement it is equally very important to control the systemic inflammation if it is present 
and this is very important to remember that at least three months after absolute infirmity control is required uh, before scheduling the surgery. Otherwise, during, uh, after post-operative, there is chance of flare up the post. Uh, this EVIT is much more, uh, and the, this surgery, the EVIT uh, cut should be performed under cover of the steroid. Means you have to start uh, putting the steroid uh, three to seven days before uh, uh, doing the. Uh, surgery uh, and some of the conditions so it is very important to know the etiology of the uitis also because some of the cases associated with uh, different systemic involvement that case also requires the supplementation of the this systemic corticosteroid that case maybe is, they are the juvenile edu this idi idiopathic arthritis Granulometrous interior uveitis, intermediate uveitis, including parsclonitis, posterior uveitis, pain uveitis, uh, in person or history of cystoid mectifer is there. These cases, uh, systemic uh, steroid should be supplemented before doing the cataract surgery. As you know, the uveitis may be sometimes associated with cystoid macroedema, or otherwise it may not associate it, sometimes it may develop post due to the inflammation. So it can be prevented by the, the use of uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory in the form of or, or the, this uh, bromophenic other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory is important. It helps to definitely, it helps to development of the cystoid macroedema. Sometimes you may have the, this uh, uh, may may be associated with glaucoma and sometimes process, processing pathology. So this is the question, uh, if it is associated with greater what to do, whether it should be com uh, this combined surgery should be done or later. If it has been observed that if you uh, do the combined surgery, means cataract uh, glaucoma, chances of failure of glaucoma surgery much more. So it is in this these ca cases, it is advised to do the cataract surgery first and followed by the glaucoma survey, but if there is involvement of the posterior segment, this combined surgery can be performed, means you can perform, as I say very well, simply you can address also the posterior segment pathology. So in these cases, this preoperative evaluation is very, very important. As you know, it is associated with various uh, anatomical uh, complications of interior segment and posterior segment, so select time examination, interior and posterior segment by these different, these tests, it is very important. And uh, now coming to the sum of the important part of this, uh, this surgical part, you know, small people is a big challenge when you operate for UIT cutter. In many cases, it is necessary to perform the synucleosis, remove pupillary membrane, perform pupillary relaxing incision, maybe li like an inspectorotomy, even using iris detector, or uh, iris hook, uh, it, it required for the adequate size of the, uh, the pupil just to expose the cataract. So this I will discuss in my this small video clip. These are some of the procedures, just photograph the, how you can, uh, how the stage people is helpful to dilate the, to dilate the pupil. Or multiple external sometimes it is needed. Uh, otherwise, you, if you pull in, in different direction, one particular quadrant, there's a lot of damage to the inspector, it may take place. So if you make a small, small cut, uh, this, then the pupil is maintained post-operatively. This is the old technique, uh, no, nobody is doing, but earlier uh, this has been uh, described in the literature. And uh, now I have a, you know, whatever the surgical um, procedure you can do, there is chances of damage to the inspector is always there. So what will happen post after uh, people may be dilated, so that may lose a lot of problem, glare, etc. Um, so I have innovated, this is my own technique. This is my innovative technique, full and push method. Means if it, I, I have shown the, this photograph for the stretch property. You are, you are thus uh, uh, stretching in orthogonal direction, mean 180 degree part. If you want 180 degree part do, that definitely damage the inspector. But if you will stretch one particular direction and another direction, no stretching, the heart will happen, the, the iris may be stretched one direction, so the chances of damage to the inspector much less. So only the question how to expose the area where you are working there, means that which site you are doing the axis, then it's just only to pull that, the push or pull and that particular direction, so chance of damage to be, be less. So I have innovated this take a pull and push method by with the help of y shaped uh, sensory hook, push, and then if you want to pull it by curved uh, sensory hook and pull it, 
I will show in the, my video this procedure. And that this paper has been published in the National Journal in the year 2017. But the main question is small pupil is the big problem. Another big problem is the how to remove the nuclei in such a small pupil. That I will also show by biomanual technique. I will, uh, I will show in my small video clip. Another certain precaution you have to take in these cases. The iris management must be done very gently. Large capillaries is preferred. Otherwise, what happens is will make a small, because of a small pupil, sometimes what happens is you, you are able, you are, you are making only small uh, rexes. But the chances of the capsular phimosis is there. That may lose a lot of problems of lectures and even the lens may take place. So sufficient at least 5.5 to 6 mm rex is very impo important. Uh, and the regarding I will, you know, hip, this uh, hypanin coated lens is preferred. Uh, in case of FECO, the hydrophilic acry acrylic, maybe not the silicon I will is advised. The post optic is very also very, very important, you know. Uh, uh, what happens the most common and most feared uh, complication of post haptic intraocular inflammation. So aggressive control of inflammation is recommended after cataract surgery vitis. Otherwise, the whole purpose of the surgery will fail. Sometimes you know a post haptic cyclist can be added for the first two weeks. Now I am just it is better to just show some of the video directly. Though because of limited time, I have only so few cases, one or two cases, you can see. This is a case of the this uh, evitic cataract with lot of synechia and pupil membrane is there. So you know how the first you have to do the synecolysis by tangential movement. This is very important uh, how to break, uh, break the synechia when it's tangential movement with the now with the help of microcell. It's still in the pupil margin. There is uh, pupil membrane is present. So with the help of this um, uh, micro seizure, you have to cut the this pupil membrane without damaging. Now this this is the pull and push method. This is my innovative print. And with the help of Y shaped, just push the iris one to two direction and they start doing the axis and gradually both the hand you have to make a little bit of practice. Both the hand you have to rotate simultaneously rather than one hand. Now at this junction, pull the iris. So expose the this cartet or capsule in this particular area and then again this uh, push uh, another direction and gradually, gradually uh, this enlarge the rexis and uh, now again you can see how to expose with the help of YSEP, uh, this sensory hook, push it and then gradually you can remove and you can see how much in such a small pupil you are able uh, to make a large capsular rexis of required capsular rexis properly. You can see the rexis is complete, just on one attachment and now lastly you can see how it is can be com uh, completed without any extension. Now you can see in the and then this is the, again, this is very important part, how to do this bimanual technique. This little hydrodiction, at this point, so lift it. First, you know, lift the nucleus with the Sinsky hook uh, at one hand, and then gradually lift it, and then with this lifting movement, rotate it. Let's see, this is such a small, this, this movement is very, very important, how to prolize the nucleus of large size such in such a small people. And the rest of the process is very easy. Then you can remove with the irrigating wire back this, and then, you can see this such a small pupil. Uh, you can just implant the eye well variable without damaging the inspector much more. You can see the small piece. This now coming to another. So how you can see this is So you know this is the this is the second case. You, know, you can see the in the pupillary region there is a this pupillary membrane is covered with whole of the pupillary this inflated pupillary membrane. This such a small pupil, lot of uh, cyanic is there. So you can first uh, dissect the the pupillary membrane. Uh, you can just make a hole in the pupillary membrane. Then with the help of side port, two side port or different side port can be made. Then this we have to give sufficient time. And gently you can remove. Do you know the pupillary border? There is a pup uh, this membrane is there. Lot of this infinite membrane is there. So do the this pupillary edge resection. Only the I am just removing only the pupillary membrane attached at the pupillary border without damaging 
the is sphincter then go to another another side and then you can even sometimes you can hold hold the pupil in membrane and then with the help of micro scissors cut the pupil in membrane membrane and you can see the pupil is how this the pupil is becomes visible the lens is visible and you can you can do this another procedure stage by polarity ortho in orthogonal direction means 180 degree apart in two are two sides are even more than more than two sides then you can sufficiently you can see the how the pupil is sufficiently dilated without using the iris hook so it, it, this much uh, size is sufficient to perform the sics in these cases so there are uh, different methods of the, this dilate in the pupil i have shown only two at this center and then you can just complete it this of the procedure you can see and then again uh, do a small uh, hydrodissection. Don't do vigorous. Otherwise, chance of this. It, now you can see the how to remove it. You can see with the right side just press the nucleus posteriorly. With another one, slightly lift it, and then once it is uh, this prolapse in one pole is visible, then you can rotate it with the with the help of both the hand. This is bimodal technique, very very useful for such a small people. And uh, you can see rest is very easy. as routine. Routinely, you can. We were doing the SIC surgery. You can wash it. You can see how it is. The fundus is become visible and implant. Right. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, uh, Professor S. P. Singh. Uh, he has a collection of many more cassettes, and if you are interested, you can directly talk to him and he'll send all those video cassettes to you it's because of shortage of time that we are just giving this many minutes to you so uh, we have the same session running in <laughs> the other hall so we will be uh, rotating ourselves from here to there therefore uh, I would like to speak first and then uh, I'll request Dr. Shama to speak and Dr. Pranav they have just started uh, their session in Hall H so I have seen Argentinian flag signs several times in hypermature cataracts, but I am seeing Argentinian flag for the first time. Have you seen this flag before? You must have seen as cataract surgeon. Dekha hai? But this flag, you know what it depicts? It depicts two colors of the sky in the blue. That is our dye. And in the center, this white is there. And in, in the within that, you have the sun. So these are some of the things that are there in Argentinian flag sign and was uh, in 1802 or 1862 this was uh, proposed by one of the proposer there in Argentina and the biggest name in it from Argentina you all know is Messi Maradona is also from Argentina so who is bigger uh, presently Messi so Maradona has become late because he started using drugs and he died because of that I think perhaps he had a heart attack somewhere no okay so two big names are there from and their airline is also very nice so and they became independent uh, they were also like us the UK was the Malik of our uh, country there it was Spain they became independent from them long time back so this is Argentina they are doing wonders in sports and other activities so I would <laughs> just by the way I thought that I should mention because I keep on telling always that whatever name comes to it we should have to learn a little bit we should have to ask some of the girls if they ask what the flag is so therefore I said that I should tell a little bit about I was not knowing about Maradona so I learned this also
it occurs, then it becomes slightly problematic to manage this case. And FECO definitely is contraindicated. Then, sir, please welcome. <laughs> Professor Lahane from yeah. Mumbai. He's a big name in SICS. Very high volume surgeon. We are happy that he is here and would be yes. there on the chair. So, Argentina flag sign, uh, as you all know, can occur any time. So this is my video about this. You make a small incision. So FACO is contraindicated when you have this Argentina flag sign because the uh, capsular, when you uh, give a nick, it, it goes to equator and it can go from the equator to the posterior surface of the posterior capsule and cause PCR without any problem. So here you have to be very, very careful. Uh, while doing surgery in SICS can be done e slightly easier compared to FACO emulsification. So you make an incision, a large incision is being made because you have a hypermature cataract. You have pointer. Madam, on mobile. Madam on mobile, you have a pointer. <laughs> So this is a very, very big hypermature cataract. And as we all, all always talk, uh, this, uh, uh, this kind of cataract may need a larger incision. Although it, it is white cataract, but it's not very hard. So a brown cataract would, of course, need even 8 millimeter incision to deliver the nucleus out. If it is uh, a smaller, uh, this thing, this kind of cataract, maybe this is a younger patient, but the cataract is really filled with the cataract and the fluid. So the capsule is swollen. So what it does is that when you give a nick, it suddenly, the one nick and because of the pr internal lenticular pressure, the nick ex extends on both the sides and you are in trouble. You have, you have been doing very wonderful SICS for years together and suddenly you have this complication. So this is the entry that you have to make. You have to should be careful because the lens is swollen and you see it's interlenticular pressure is so much that the air bubble was coming out. Then you inject air and dye to have a contrast during capsulorexis. I do with uh, this forceps and I had made this nick there and was uh, putting fluid there and you would see that not much of disturbance there, just uh, initiating. You see, I went for the Visilon and this is spread. So this is called Argentina flag sign. Only the sun is not there. My sun is sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> you have sun and the sky and the earth and uh, so this is there. So you, what, you, what then you do? Actually, what are the means? You can take this nucleus out of the bag or what you can do is that as the technique was told by Professor S.P. Singh, you can simply rotate it and take it out. But when you, when you would be rotating it, it would further cause extension into the posterior capsule and it would lead to the posterior capsular rupture. So what we do is that we give two nicks there. Uh, you would see how we are giving nicks there. We give one nick on this side and try to do again rexis. You can take out the cortical matter, but it is not there, so nothing was taken out. And you simply do complete rexis, uh, not complete, but half moon type of rexis, this thing and this. You should have a good sharp uh, Vana scissors. Otherwise, if you make too many nicks and it does not cut, then you will have problem. So you can slightly have a space to rotate the nucleus there and then you enlarge the incision. So while enlarging, you should take care that you go downwards while cutting. And once the incision has been extended, you do a little bit of hydrocyte dissection because the already there is interlenticular pressure. This will come pop up pop out of the bag. Once it comes out, your life becomes easier. 
and you can take out the nucleus without problem and you slightly carefully you take this out and this is this has been taken out then visco expression of the cortical matter or epinucleus whatever little is there that is done and then you do cortical aspiration and you should be careful not to hold the capsule too much otherwise it will pull the capsule and again the chances of PCR is there. You can see the margin of the red cis on this side, on the other side it's not seen but you can <coughs> simply put it there without problem. The only thing that you have to do is that you keep on injecting this lawn repeatedly, keep the chamber deep and you will be successful. So this is one case which I have for Argentina flag sign. I wanted to share it with you. Thank you so much. <laughs> the next speaker is uh, Professor Lahane has come, so I would request him to please, <laughs> because he has to go to the other hall also. sir uh, singh sir and my friends now this is the sics is very close to my heart uh, and in year uh, if you count my surgeries in a year i do near about uh, 6000 above 6000 cataract surgery out of that always my 2000 cataract surgeries are light thoda dim kar sakte ho my 2000 cataract surgeries are by the SICS and uh, as I am in Mumbai, the maximum people light dim, dim karo light ko. So I do FECO also, but I love SICS. Now the, my topic given to me by Kambaljik Singh sir is the management of corneal opacities uh, and how you can go ahead and do the uh, yes, I say it's in the corneal opacities. Now see the, uh, you can have so many corneal opacities it that the keratoplasty followed by cataract or cataract with aridotomy or cataract with keratoplasty, whatever. You can have a triple procedure or aridotomy. It means are you doing optical today or optic doing optical is a crime? No. If patient is one-eyed and you are operating uh, for cataract, and here there is a central corneal opacity. I will always advise go for the optical because the graft may not survive. And as that patient is having some vision, she or he may lose the vision. So it is not a crime. The, there may be new technologies that the transplant may help, but sometimes transplant may not help. So it is better to go with the optical. And just now in last week, I have done one optical keratoplasty finger counting vision was there, the girl was 20 years old and one eye, other eye is thysis and the central opacity, I did only optical keratoplasty, uh, no removal of cataract and she has got 6 by 60 vision and she is very happy. So delay in the visual rehabilitation, risk of endothelial loss, graft rejection in high risk cases, why we should do, poor patient compliance positive of the good quality donor corneas and the IOL calculation errors. There's so many things in the keratoplasty, so we should avoid that. Then other thing is the keratoplasty followed by cataract surgery. Yes, this is the age old method. Yes, you can do it. Does not provide the clear central visual axis and eccentric visual axis sometimes and it may be a compromised binocularity in this situation. Now cataract with aerodotomy. Now this is the uh, with keratoplasty, the triple procedure, delay in visual reputation, the risk of the endothelial loss, anterior chamber reaction, refractive surprises, 
and positive of the good quality donor corneas can be there. Now the, if you are going to do the cataract surgery first and then the uh, keratoplasty, yes, now see, this is a small pupil, non-dilating, and there is a corneal opacity. Now this patient, if you are operating, what I am doing, you will see, first I am breaking the sinecia. So this sinecia, whenever I am breaking, after that also pupil may or may not expand. But sometimes you will get some expansion. Is the light come now? Oh. Uh, is the light come karo na re? Haan, dim karo usko. Dim karo. So that they can see the video. Now see, here you will see the what I am doing is, again, here I am just going in and once I go in here, then see. So extension is very, very important. When you extend it properly, now here again I am rotating outside the rexis and then rotating outside the pupil. It means you will have to deliver the lens from two places, the small pupil and the rexis. And once it is in the anterior chamber, then you can definitely remove, see here what I am doing is the putting this and that gradually on the, uh, I am removing the lens. So it is possible to remove, but FACO sometimes is not possible in this situation. So this is what is the, uh, can see the corneal opacity, uh, 3.5 to 3 millimeter with the anterior uh, subcapsular cataract and you see this there is a epithelial defect you can see this is another corneal opacity and now what went wrong in this you can see here the here you will have to use the prophylactic antivirals again the uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs and then wait for the eye to be quiet so there is no hurry. You should not operate the patient when the, there is a infection and that is active infection. Wait and then you can operate. Uh, with the C, always remember when there is a coronal opacity with the ghost vessels, vessels are seen, then you should have more consciousness than uh, the opacity without vessels. Now, every opacity you must check the corneal sensations and this is very easy for a corneal opacity you can see sensations and then you go ahead the other thing is the vernal keratoconjunctivitis cataract usually develops secondary to the chronic use of steroids yeah this young age with the posterior subcapsular cataract now here what happens the mother of the kid is very very unhappy and this uh, mother definitely uh, takes the kid to the so many doctors and once there is a redness then the doctors they may prescribe the steroids and once they prescribe the steroids then the redness is reduced and then there is a habit of the mother to put that steroid continuously for longer duration and that causes the problem. So you will get the limbitis, papillitis, these uh, papillaries are there, inflammation is there and once that is there, what you should recommend is should be performed only in the non-inflamed eye after active VKC is under control. Otherwise you should not. So this vernal keratoconjunctivitis, if it is controlled, then only go for the cataract surgery. Otherwise there is one complication by putting steroid, then you will create another complication by removing the cataract. Now here the topical immunomodulators you can use or the syst uh, systemic immunomodulators you can use according to your convenience. Now cataract with pterygium, it is always you see the cataract. Now small pterygium less than 3 millimeter not affecting the topography can be left alone or treat with the cataract or latra. The medium more than the 3 uh, millimeter is affecting the topography also. Uh, now, pterygium should be treated by the priority first 
and then go for cataract so that astigmatism may not be there much and then the last stage is am affecting the visual axis so you first go for the uh, terrigen surgery and then go for the SICL surgery or cataract surgery now the what is the take home points in this so large terrigen more than 3 mm the affecting visual axis should be treated with terrigen followed by cataract surgery now here you can see the what i am doing is you can see the operated the patient first for the terrigen the for 2 years uh, old patient the terrigen surgery was done and after the terrigen surgery you can see the then you can go ahead and you can remove the lens so that this time i know the astigmatism this time i know the uh, the a scan or the eye master is possible and the uh, whenever you are implanting the lens that may be near perfection so always remember without doing cataract uh, you should first do terrigen and then go for the cataract surgery the can see the 28 years old male the intumescent cataract with the raised ventricular pressure and you can see the sutures can you see the sutures there so that is because of the trauma the patient has came in the after this now this patient can see i am operating without removing of the sutures normally whenever you are removing the suture after that you should operate the patient but here patient has no vision and once patient is not having any vision and do, no inflammation uh, in the uh, you can say this uh, your suture in such situation you can go for the removal of the cataract and after removal of the cataract when the wound is healed then you can go for the removal of the uh, sutures but my advice always to the student is first to remove the sutures let that wound get healed and after that you can go for the SICS but vice versa is possible so you have seen the nucleus is removed what I am doing is removing the vertex see here the AP nucleus that I am removing and once you have removed the AP nucleus then you can see the glow and once glow is seen it is possible to remove the uh, vertex and you can see the rexis is seen here up till now rexis was not seen now you can see the rexis and then you can implant this lens inside the uh, bag so the conclusions are the preoperative throw workup ocular surface disturbers with the cataract needs the holistic management approach and then the cataract surgery should be customized for every patient depending uh, upon the extent of disease prior counseling about the uh, this aggravation of the primary disease is very very important thank you very much thank you another doctor. is the follow up thank, thank you. you dr ranesh for such a, such a nice uh, presentation and excellent videos of different cases are very rightly said that the the is to should be customized means every person needs different outcomes surgery and different precautions we have to take and uh, as i would like to add one thing that he is a pioneer of this uh, Uh, SICS, as I already told, that is a uh, uh, close to my heart. Definitely, I because of his this surgery, a uh, popularized in the whole country, and because of this season, I would like to say that he got the Padma Shri award only because of pop his popularity and the big uh, this high volume surgeon, uh, and uh, after the most of the person because of blessing of uh, all the person he is doing excellent, and he is also excellent physical surgeon. I have seen. number of times has a videos of so hard cut right hardest cut right he is very nicely but he is still doing the sic surgery so he is a source of inspiration for our, uh, all of us and lastly and we have seen the conference for two days continuously such a uh, nicely arranged this uh, uh, our excellent arrangement <laughs> wonderful arrangement big hands to dr lahan thank you thank you very much welcome you all for this conference sir okay that is it thank you so much now uh, the next speaker is dr sama devidi as uh, so going to speak on the um, terrigen uh, with the cataract there is a lot of confusion though dr tp lahane are very rightly said 
that the first uh, do the uh, terrorism then followed by the this uh, uh, kataya surgery but dr samad vedi with in detail this is going to talk and discuss why uh, this uh, surgery which surgery should be done first and he is also excellent oculoplastic surgeon and in front of um, dr samad vedi her uh, guru and teacher is present dr rp morya he will definitely uh, will make request to share as experience about uh, this talk and uh, some give some of the tips to the to the audience especially the youngsters thank you very much dr ha start dr. thank Samadhi. you sir for your kind introduction uh, good evening uh, respected seniors and dear delegates i would be talking about sics with coexisting terrigium now why is it important because uh, nearly one tenth of new opd patients they have pterygium in at least one eye and half of them have coexistent cataract both of them have uv radiation as an important predisposing factors so should we always deal deal with them simultaneously it is uh, just to show what is the magnitude of problem as we go towards uh, south india the incidence of pterygium goes as increasing just as proportionate to the uv radiation concern with terrigium is due to the rp morya to come with me i am alone please come <laughs> please concern with terrigium uh, excellent teacher sorry to excellent sure. teacher and uh, academician par excellence of national international deputy please come and share your experience in, in front of us please uh, continue thank you sir concern with terrigium is due to the terrigium induced astigmatism which in uh, which affects the iol power apart from cosmesis and studies have shown that even a grade 2 pterygium may induce about 3 diopter with the real astigmatism and excision of pterygium will uh, affect not only both the meridian but also both the corneal surfaces persons who are predisposed they are usually from the lower socio economic strata and if you unattend the pterygium during cataract surgery it will increase the chances of refractive as post operatively so what does pterygium associated astigmatism it is the sum of pre existing astigmatism as well as the pterygium induced astigmatism and they are independent variates usually when we perform cataract surgery in older patients more than 50 years they have against the rule astigmatism whereas pterygium induces with the rule astigmatism so there may be situations that the patient's own astigmatism may be neutralized by the pterygium induced astigmatism so uh, what factors it may depend upon you can uh, decide the how important the pterygium is for that patient in sense of astigmatism by the horizontal length it was uh, classified by tan by surface area or by vascularity which classification was proposed by sang we have another uh, comprehensive cl uh, classification proposed by johnson as well which take in takes into an account multiple factors because uh, not a single factor will determine the astigmatism induced by pterygium all these ta are taken into account now refraction is difficult in pterygium because the changes are in one meridian that to half of the meridian so this hemi astigmatism is difficult to measure and due to its hemi astigmatism nature the acceptance of cylinders for the poor keratometry measures only the central 3 mm of the cornea so topography is the best but in large pterygium topography is neither feasible nor required as sequential surgery is mandatory pterygium induced astigmatism is reversible except when you have corneal scarring like in deep pterygiums and you should repeat the keratometry after 4 and 6 weeks to look for stability of cornea period required for stabilization may vary depending upon the pterygium now how much change do we accept expect it is positively correlated with preoperative grade of pterygium as well as a preoperative astigmatic value so higher preoperative astigmatic value you will get a larger post operative change there is a technical glitch when if in case you perform a bears lera you detect more steepening on topography it is simply when you perform the bears lera but otherwise in if you have different modes of graft fixation there no change in the individual modes 
sequential is always proven to be better whenever you are performing cataract and glaucoma or cataract and endothelial keratoplasty and same is true for cataract and pterygium as well. But we should uh, prefer to do it simultaneously especially because it reduces the hospitalization, it reduces the cost for the patient, it reduces the burden on the hospital. So if you have a small pterygium, if you have a patient with low or absent astigmatism, they are regular mass and regular central corneal curvature, then they must be operated simultaneously. Now regarding the graft harvesting, you can harvest super from the superotemporal bulba conjunctiva Definitely that is the most preferred area. But since you have to perform the SICS surgery as well, so sometimes harvesting a graft from that area becomes difficult. So what other options you have? If you have access to amniotic membrane, wet or cryopreserved, any of them will do. Uh, some people have proposed uh, isolating the conjunctiva from pterygium tissue as well. I recommend if it's a thin atrophic pterygium, very well you can go and isolate it from the pterygium itself. But if it has a thick fibrosed, I mean thick fleshy type of pterygium, it gives a very bad cosmosis if you use the tissue from the pterygium itself. Now what should be the position of the tunnel? If you have a superior tunnel, it will negate uh, with the rule astigmatism to some extent. If it is a double headed pterygium, you have to go superiorly. In superior conjunctival scarring, or if you have less than one diopter of wither rule astigmatism, you have to perform a temporal incision. Or whenever you are performing uh, any surgery, look for scleral thinning and uh, just rule out that area. Incisions has to be watertight, and if there are any leaky incision, please suture them. And we choose to avoid antimetabolites. The IOL power uh, change change during the simultaneous surgery has been proposed differently by different authors. What we practice is we reduce IL power by 0.5 in grade 2 and by 1 diopter in grade 3 and they usually perform very well. There are also various regression formulas available for the IOL calculation which may you may use. Regarding the astigmatism management, if it is a simultaneous surgery, we don't perform any astigmatism management because uh, the results may be unpredictable, but you can perform the incision on the steep axis. And in sequential surgeries, the method of astigmatism is same as in any SICS. So this was one of my cases where it was TANS grade 3 and SANS grade 2. So this is a keratometry prior to the pterygium surgery. You can see the vertical meridian was steeper. These photographs were taken from the keratometer. Topography was not feasible because pterygium was invading almost up till the pupil. So we performed the conjunctival graft with electrocoaptation. And uh, this was the corneal topography one month after the pterygium surgery. You can see actually that the vertical meridian became flatter now. And the, it was a horizontal meridian which became steeper. So now we performed the cataract surgery one month after pterygium surgery and we placed a temporal incision and uh, that was the on the axis, steep axis we placed the incision and so it uh, flattened the horizontal meridian a bit and so the astigmatism was minimized. So this is how you can plan and you can actually control the astigmatism just by pterygium surgery and planning your incision on the steep axis. So in conclusion, I would like to say sequential surgery is better than simultaneous surgery as it prevents the post-operative uh, surprises, but definitely if the patient is a candidate for uh, simultaneous surgery, you can do simultaneous surgery as well. But if you want to do simultaneous surgery in candidates who are not fit in the criteria, always remember to reduce the IOL power and please don't attempt astigmatism management in simultaneous surgeries. Thank you. Now I will, yes. Thank you, Dr. Thank Samad Devit, had an excellent talk, a very good information. As you know, uh, nowadays, uh, cataract is not a simple cataract surgery, but uh, is a rather is a refractory cataract surgery. The main is, you know, you have to take care of the astigmatism. Means the main aim is how to provide a, a good vision near to the normal, that is 6-6 vision, and you can achieve only 
by controlling or managing the aesthetic disorder, other associated with aesthetic bodies or the pre-existing aesthetic bodies or surgically, surgically induced aesthetic bodies. You have to, if you take care of this thing, this is as good as the FECO. There is no difference. If you are able to provide, if you manage the aesthetic bodies, then there is no difference, not at all, in the SICS or, or the, uh, the FECO surgery. Might be some difference with the ECC where the sutures you are applied the suture, but once you are doing the SICS, uh, the wound is as strong um, as the normal eye or the FECO. So the only question is the length of the incision of both the FECO, uh, FECO and the SICS. So I should be part. So very nicely, Dr. Samad has uh, enumerated and uh, dis described the very things how to control. I should be when to do, when to, uh, to operate. Thank you very much. You have any questions? Thank you, sir. Uh, this weeks are sufficient for after pterygium surgery but uh, if you see there are significant change between uh, second week and fourth week maybe you can wait for 15 days more six weeks is enough thank you now i request uh, uh, a commission dr p moria to make some comment thank you dr sama nicely presenting uh, cases of uh, pterygium Simultaneous surgery of the pterygium and SICS. Pterygium as well as SICS both is an important topic concerned for youngsters and beginners. But I am saying that the management of pterygium is not very simple. Pterygium concerned uh, with the vision as well as astigmatism. Similarly, SICS, uh, perfect SICS also give good vision equally as the FACO emulsification. There are so many uh, techniques to manage the pterygium. It depends on the types of pterygium, whether it is a trophic, whether it is recurrent type or malignant pterygium. But pterygium management, uh, surgery of the pterygium along with the SICS is, I think it is a very difficult and it needs expertization. And then one can do the both simultaneous pterygium and cataract surgery. Otherwise, just Dr. Lehane says, that he start pterygium first, then start the SICS for beginners. Uh, head of the Department of Ophthalmology here in Bombay in JJ Hospital and they are also again Professor Lahane and Professor Ragni they are very very big high volume surgeons and uh, you will see them operate Thank you so my uh, gurus Padmashri Dr. Lahane sir Dr. Kamaljit Singh sir and Dr. S.P. Singh sir and everybody present here today. Sir, thank you for giving me the opportunity always to present. And uh, you know, everybody uh, is a very good um, FACO surgeon. But you know, my teachers are advocates of SICS because uh -huh. even today in because India, 70 to 80 percent of the cataracts are done by SICS. We have to learn FACO, that is the future, but we de do need to know so I will be talking on SICS in subluxated cataract. There may be lots of factors which may cause subluxation. Means there may be trauma, previous surgery, intravitreal injections, various syndromes. Pseudo exfoliation remains a part of our life because we work, though we work in regional institutes, we get a lot of drainage from the interior of India. And in some cases it may be stationary or it may be progressive, like say for example in a patient of pseudo exfoliation, the earlier you do surgery, the better it is for the patient. Management uh, depends on proper preoperative precautions because whenever we see a subluxated cataract, we know that it is going to be a complicated surgery and you need to keep lots of standby things like a CTR ring, a vitrectomy setup 
it will differ from your routine SICA surgeries and because the surgery may end up being complicated, post-operative management changes too. So it is very, very important. Whenever a patient is examined, so whatever facilities we have available, like say for example, if we have a slit lamp available and the rule of the thumb is whatever you see on slit lamp, the actual subluxation on the table will be more than what is seen on the slit lamp. UBM if the facilities are available, B scan is a must because if the patient has subluxated, if the retina is not seen, then a B scan or a proper retina examination because of the medical legal issues involved. Because a patient of trauma, what are the preoperative precautions is counselling, counselling and counselling. It's very, very important because at one setting, the patient may not have an intraocular lens. The patient may need a second setting for the IOL implantation. The need for a vitrectomy. So in a private setup, maybe if you want to call a vitreous surgeon or yourself, then the other things that go with the vitrectomy, need for extra cost and finances in case of CTR rings and segments. And... Uh, the risk of retinal detachment, cystoid macular edema, post-operative. So the patient counselling in these cases is very, very important. Intraoperative management depends on the amount of subluxation. So if there is a very, very small subluxation, we can get away. CTR rings are a boon. It can, you can get away with implanting a CTR ring which will inflate the bag and allow the implantation of the IOL in the bag. And if it is greater than three to six hours, then maybe you need extra supplementation with segments and uh, double loop um, CTR rings with IOL. And if it is very, very large, then maybe uh, there is no possibility of even uh, CTR ring and IOL implantation. Then you have to remove the, new, the cataract, do a vitrectomy and then go for an SF IOL or an iris fixated IOL. So the incision placement is very important. It is placed away from the zonular weakness. Now this is only like just now uh, we have simultaneous courses and I thank sir for coming to give there a talk. And he was just saying that see, you can supposing temporal incision, but your incision has to be superior only. You try to make it temporal, there may be other complications. So as much as possible away from the site of weakness, that is important but a sclerocorneal incision and normally you would try to say that I want to make a very, very small incision. Here, a comfortable incision is important because you don't want extra manipulation, <coughs> having a small incision and trying to remove the nucleus. So that is extremely important. Viscoelastic, a good viscoelastic and a proper amount of viscoelastic is important. Capsular excess, we have to start away from the zone of dialysis. Dye will help you make a proper excess. The rexis is elastic because of the weak zonules like in a pediatric case. So maybe a use of utratus forceps is very, very important. So as you can see over here, this is a patient where a dye is used. You can see the area of subluxation because the orange glow is very, very clearly visible. The rexis will be decentered compared to the, uh, the subluxation and that's what we feel. But it's important because if you try to central it or go close to the area of zonular dialysis, then it may extend. So as you can see over here, there is a comfortable rexis, a complete rexis has been possible. So this is extremely important. Hydro dissection or hydro procedures, have you have to do very, very carefully because you don't want to land into trouble by creating more stress on the zonules. IOLs. You have to decide how to place the IOL. Placement of the IOL itself, the, the haptic of the IOL may act as a segment of the CTR ring and allow to inflate the bag or make the placement central. So that is important. CTR rings are a boon. There are many types of CTR rings. Different sizes are available. So this is, and when to insert and how to insert. So you have to use, there is an eyelet and you can slowly, uh, you know, put the ring inside or uh, you can, and the, what is the, when is the time? As you can see, so this is a ring. So you put one loop and slowly, you know, it has a circular movement, which is very, very important. And you keep on feeding more parts of the, the ring itself. It can be put uh, initially after the rexis. It can be put after the delivery of the nucleus. Each has its merit and demerit. And the loops help you to put the ring inside the bag. 
so it can be put before or it can be put after the this thing complications contraindications of the ctr ring is when you do not have a rexis when there is a pc tear whether there is excessive weakness and it should not be used in patients with scleral disorders because sometimes in a thin sclera it has been known to come out and we have seen sir we have seen patients where a patient was referred to us and we found more than one or two rings in subluxated iol rings inside the vitreous so there is no point in doing all this so one has to be very very careful so So in this patient, as you can see over here, uh, this is a subluxated and, and the serrated edges that you see are evidence that the lens is subluxated over there. This is the rexis as you can see. So making a rexis, uh, it, it takes time and then you can put in the CTR ring. So from the side port, this ring is put under the capsule and then it is fed slowly so that and it since it is it it has a memory what it will do is it will automatically go into the equator and it will occupy the space inflating the bag so that is very very important so both the the, the ctr ring has to be completely inside the bag and as you can see over here implantation of the iol the iol itself will help you to inflate the bag you can see the ring over there which has allowed the black bag to expand and the placement of the IOL with the ring and inside the bag so the ring has expanded the bag and it allows uh, in the bag IOL post operative monitoring is to see and to ensure a well centered IOL at the end of surgery remove the vitreous we can use uh, Kennecott also and the viscoelastic. The pupil has to be circular. There should be no vitreous into the anterior chamber. The IOP has to be monitored because you do not, maybe secondary to inflammation. Pseudo phacodonesis may cause cystoid macular edema and proper retinal examination is important. The take home message is that satisfactory results can be got with proper preoperative planning. Use of CTR and CTSs when indicated. An adequate in anterior vitrectomy which is mandatory and using a simple safe technique for the better results in the patients. Thank you sir. I really thank you for thank giving you me the opportunity <coughs> always to be a part of your course. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you sir. So uh, uh, I think uh, Pranav you are left. So you come over and because the other session may be there. Thank you sir. Thank you thank so you. much. You sir with your permission go? can I yes, leave yes, back yes, and I'm extremely thank sorry. You. We, I'm, I would love to sit here with sir and learn from everybody, but unfortunately my course and is also running. So with everybody's permission, thank you, I, thank you thank so you much, so sir. Much. Thank you. Thank and Pranav is young, dynamic, and he's slowly becoming a part of the Bombay Ophthalmic Association Society. Thank you, ma'am. So, you, uh, Dr. S.P. Singh, you have a lot of experience on subluxated lens. Can you tell us a little bit more about subluxated eyes? I'll just, in the meantime, just uh, <laughs> prepare. Ah, he's preparing, ah. yes. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kamalji Singh. Uh, I have uh, definitely uh, a big list. Uh, of this uh, subluxated lens, but I have updated most of the uh, the question with FUCO only. We have only few cases with SICS, uh, but definitely the SICS also equally good. Uh, uh, main the tips you know you should assess uh, the amount of the subluxation is very very important. As Dr. Ragni very rightly said that uh, what you are seeing with the slit time it might be uh, subluxation more than that you are seeing with the slit time. So you ha how to observe, only you can see if you dilate completely and then uh, just turn the eyeball in different directions. 
then only you can further assess it. I have seen that, that how you can just rotate the eyeball different directions, so you can further assess uh, the subluxation. And similarly, you can see also most of the time due subluxation, uh, it may be the joints may be completely turned, or sometimes this is only some some uh, the joints are turned, some are present. It is uh, associated with subluxation. This is also very important. If if uh, there, I have seen that you can see very well with the subluxated lens, you can see joint uh, attachment. Some are, if some of the joints are attached, it means. Um, and uh, this is process those supplies supplies is there but it prevents the prolapse of the bts prolapse so but if it, if it completely absent if the supplies if the genus are completely absent then chances of the bts is is there so if you we'll start even uh, doing the uh, this uh, cortex surgery either fake or uh, other sics vitus may comes so you keep it uh, the bt vitrectomy is ready if you are able if you do the vitrectomy then there, there is no problem but once it comes uh, and internally and you proceed then it will fail in complete uh, doing the complete uh, this uh, procedure so this is very important don't worry and the vitrectomy also is even the entire segment can can do very well but you have to keep uh, this entire vitrectomy ready and do the vitrectomy then you can perform very well uh, as sir thank you very much thank you sir thank you Prano? so uh, I, I, now the prano is going to talk another very very important uh, very very subjected i already told earlier um, that after discussion after the talk with the dr shama devi that nowadays uh, this assessment is very important how to how to take care of the assessment either it may be present um, the preoperatively or you know in um, surgery induced assessment so you should know the your surgeon's factor. How much uh, with which technique, which how much length of the incision, this which technique, either frown shape, the straight incision, whatsoever incision is given. How much surgically induced asteroids are there? So first find out yourself that how much you are you are inducing the asteroids, or how much is a present uh, present uh, three operatory. So just combine it both, and then you can plan uh, doing the surgery how to control it. That I'm not going to discuss much. That I'm leaving to the Dr. Pranav. He's a uh, uh, lot of experience in um, doing this uh, uh, estimate, uh, contract with estimate. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor S.P. Singh, sir, and uh, Professor Kamaljeet Singh, sir, uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, they both have been uh, my teachers, and actually, Shama, ma'am, all of the people here have been my teachers, so it's a huge privilege for me. So I'll be starting with uh, MSICS uh, astigmatism management and mainly uh, the technological advances in ophthalmology have grown by leaps and bounds and it is not only our uh, it is not only our duty to improve the patient's vision but also to refine it and proper management of astigmatism is what leads to excellent visual outcomes in these cases and to achieve emetropia is the target nowadays even in SICS. So uh, the goals of the surgery are mainly painless visual recovery. Uh, we should have a spectacle independence. Uh, the correction of pre-existing astigmatism is very important uh, and the repeatability of uh, surgical result and the amount of surgically induced astigmatism which we cause should be noted and a sustained quality of vision should be provided. So as we've already talked about, there are uh, two types of astigmatism, mainly with the rule and against the rule. And against the rule is the one that we usually deal with because uh, most of the patients uh, that we deal with are older patients uh, who are undergoing cataract surgeries. So uh, the main factors affecting astigmatism, uh, which we'll deal with later, are uh, incision characteristics, the use of cautery, uh, and the use and non-use of suture, which may uh, cause astigmatism. And there should be a proper pre-operative assessment of pre-existing astigmatism in all of these cases. So uh, we usually measure the astigmatism by the help of retinoscopy, uh, keratometry or corneal topo topography. Uh, the mainstay uh, these days is corneal topography, but uh, in cases where there is uh, poor uh, fixation, corneal abnormalities, uh, distorted Myers or highly toric cornea, we still go for a manual keratometer. So uh, how to correct the astigmatism with SICS? Uh, usually, if there is pre-existing astigmatism, the incision characteristic is very important. Uh, the size of the incision, the larger the incision, the greater the flattening and the smaller the incision, the lesser the flattening. And the important thing to note is that we should always uh, operate on the steeper axis and this uh, we can make out with the keratometry findings which we've uh, got. 
Then the other thing is that the distance from the cornea, the farther the incision from the cornea, the lesser the astigmatism and the closer uh, the incision to the cornea, the more the astigmatism. And uh, this was a uh, theory which was given by Cox and uh, he said that astigmatically neutral zone I is the zone where we should uh, configure uh, the our incision onto. And uh, it was derived on two important equations that surgically induced astigmatism is uh, directly proportional to the length of incision to the power th uh, cube. And uh, it is inversely related to the distance of incision, which we've already talked about. So this is a funnel which is uh, which base is at the limbus, which is around three millimeter at the limbus. And as it moves away, it widens. So uh, this is the area where we should uh, provide the incision. So if we are closer to the cornea, uh, we have to be within this uh, funnel uh, for least ma uh, amount of astigmatism. Uh, the other thing is uh, the type of incision, whether it is superior incision, temporal incision or superior temporal incision. Uh, during our uh, post-graduation days, we are usually taught superior incision because it's, it is easy to learn. Uh, uh, there is more wound protection and lesser chances of infection and uh, lesser foreign body sensation for the patient but uh, temporal incision uh, is preferred in cases where there is e deep sockets smaller eyes and if a future trabeculectomy is needed and the important thing is that uh, because most of the patients are against the rule so temporal incision is a better incision to make so uh, it is based on the theory of coupling which suggests that the flattening effect is achieved at the tissue and steepening is produced 90 degree away due to the phenomena of coupling and surgically induced astigmatism is minus 1 to uh, 1.5 diopter which has been seen at 90 degree for 6.5 millimeter incision is placed. So uh, it has been studied by Gokhale et al. Uh, that superior incision causes around 1.28 diopters of surgically induced astigmatism but it may be different for uh, each surgeons and so it is very important to note our uh, own amount of surgically induced astigmatism that we cause. Uh, the best incision is superior temporal incision which causes the least amount of astigmatism and uh, as we've already talked about the amount of uh, the length of the incision uh, the more the astigmatism will be present. Uh, the other thing is cautery. Uh, if we do excessive cautery there occurs scleral shrinkage and scleral necrosis which may cause uh, increase in the astigmatism. So how to correct this uh, pre-existing astigmatism? In mild astigmatism uh, cases, we have to operate on the steeper axis as I've already talked about. Uh, we can neutralize by changing the site of incision. If it is an uh, against the rule, astigmatism will go for a temporal incision and if it is with the rule, we go for a superior incision. Uh, we can go for a limbal relaxing incisions which are uh, incisions which are made just 0.5 millimeter in front of the limbus uh, at a 90 percent depth and it is usually 600 uh, mu and uh, there are uh, in instruments which come with a garden knife and we can use that and we usually make it on the steeper meridian in front of the limbus. So this is uh, a case where uh, we are doing SICS and a limbal relaxing incision is giving. So we make the superior incision and uh, to cancel it out, uh, we are providing with a limbal relaxing incision in this cases. Uh, we do not enter the uh, <coughs> anterior chamber during this. So we measured the amount of usually 30 degree uh, is the amount of that is one clock hour uh, is the amount where we take the limbal relaxing incision. We can correct the amount of astigmatism with the help of a uh, nomograms. There are multiple nomograms which are present for limbal relaxing incision. There is a LRI uh, calculator also dot com which can help you decide how much astigmatism will be corrected according to that. Uh, uh, it is very imperative to check these calculations and a 90 deg degree of uh, error is the most common error. And as we've already, already talked about that the steeper axis is the one where we have to uh, make the incision to make it flatter. Uh, the other uh, important thing to note in this case is that in younger patients we have to make a larger incision and in lesser pa uh, in older patients we have to make a smaller incision like smaller than the 30 degree of paired incision and one uh, clock hour of paired incision corrects around one diopter of corneal astigmatism in these cases. So these are the multiple nomograms which have been given according to the clock hours uh, how many diopters we can uh, correct the limbal relaxing incisions. So uh, one diopter if you want to correct uh, one incision at the steeper meridian can be made. If we make a two incisions at the steeper me meridian we can correct around two diopters. So uh, we can manage it according to these nomograms. The advantages of this is that there is less tendency of shift in the resultant cylindrical axis and irregular corneal flattening and irregular astigmatism is not there which are mostly seen with arcuate incisions. 
and uh, it is mostly easier to perform than a shorter and centrally placed incisions and they usually exhibit a one is to one coupling ratio so the other thing that we can go for is a opposite clear corneal incision this was a uh, thing which was given by liver and dan and they approached the cornea with a clear corneal incision adding an identical incision on the opposite side it is usually used in uh, phaco emulsification where we can uh, if there is more astigmatism we can add uh, opposite uh, clear corneal incision in these cases but even in sics we've uh, made incisions like this and that can correct the amount of astigmatism in these cases so this uh, technique usually involves creating two biplanar uh, 3.2 millimeter incisions which is 180 degrees uh, from each other and they are placed like 1.5 to 2 millimeter inside the edge of the limbal vessels along the steeper meridian of the cornea so uh, usually in cases where there is low astigmatism we go for a frown incision at a 3 millimeter behind the cornea usually at the superior temporal site in moderate cases where there is one to two diopter we can go for a small incision centered along the steeper meridian about six millimeter and straight in relation to limbus because the straighter the incision the uh, more astigmatism will be corrected and in high cases we go for a combination of a uh, small incision profile the uh, incision characteristic and with limbal relaxing incision in these cases and post operative if there is still astigmatism we can go for astigmatic keratotomy a wound revision or an eczema laser so the take home message is that uh, we should do a careful identification of astigmatism magnitude and meridian both pre operative and intra operative and uh, we should go for a step ladder approach based on the magnitude as we've talked about and uh, the techniques can be effectively combined for uh, correcting a higher level of astigmatism and we should always apply the incision on the steeper axis that is why keratometry is important thank you Thank you, Dr. Pran. A nice presentation, and it's very in informative. As you, I already said, that is this part is very important in cataract surgery, either phaco, I say anything. Man is very important. You should know uh, what are the different type of the, this uh, incisions and how much it leads to the astigmatism. And before that, preoperatively, it is very important to assess the astigmatism. So this is very, um, uh, this is informative, uh, an excellent lecture. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So we come to the conclusion of this session, and thanks a lot. We have a very good uh, program after this. At 7:30, we have Shan, Shan Singh. Who is he? Who is he? Who is Shan? Our program. Shan Singh from Prayagraj is coming. <laughs> so he'll be dancing and uh, singing. So you have a big program there and the banquet. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor S. P. Singh. Dr. Shama, Dr. Maurya Saab, and uh, Dr. Pranav, and and, uh, and and the audience because you are the greatest source of inspiration for any speaker. Thank you.